uh, good to uh, see you all and um, thanks uh, Will and Jill and um, Stella and Alan what, for what we've had so far. Um, it is absolutely freezing here <laughs> and um, uh, I want to start by praying uh, for some supernatural warmth if nothing else. So uh, let's pray. Jesus, you're beautiful um, and so often we don't remember that you are and your spirit can bring life to dead bones and can bring life to uh, dead communities and to dead lives and churches. Find the flames, Jesus, of our love for you. I pray that we would hear you knocking and Lord, uh, just warm me up as well, uh, both spiritually and physically. Um, Lord, help me to hear your voice and help us all to hear from your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so I'm Ben, I'm here with my uh, eight-year-old Thomas, who's just sat across the way from, uh, from me, and we're going to look at the last letter today of the churches uh, in, at the start of Revelation. Uh, when I heard um, that Will was looking at uh, the, the seven churches and the letters at the beginning of Revelation, I have to say my first thought was, really? Interesting. Uh, quite kind of out there and I have to say I've, I've, re I've totally been proved wrong it, I've enjoyed it so much and I've thoroughly enjoyed all the um, people who've shared stuff so far uh, particularly last week I got loads from that um, but it's it's been a really good series um, so I uh, would just pray that uh, today as we round, round this up that the, we would hear what the Spirit is saying to us so we're looking at Laodicea today uh, this is the furthest south church um, and if you look at a map and I'd really uh, urge you to some of the speakers have used a map so far uh, the letters to these seven churches goes in a kind of clockwise direction it starts with Ephesus and goes round or that way for you um, and you finish with Laodicea. Laodicea was the furthest south um, of these churches and it's south just south of a place called Hierapolis and just north of Colossa which we know from the letter to the um, Colossians and it's at a trade crossroads um, and it massively benefited from this so uh, it was a banking center we know what that means uh, it, today it was rich place it was very very well off um, it traded in some amazing fabrics particularly a black really kind of rich uh, very uh, wonderful black fabric that it traded in textiles around that region um, as I say, it was a banking centre, and it also boasted a very fine medical school that um, specialised in eye medicine, in the healing of eyes, which has got a really fancy word, ophthalmology. Is that all right? <laughs> so thank you. Um, and so banking centre, um, textiles. Uh, it, we went to visit Singapore last year, and it kind of makes me think it wasn't quite as big as Singapore, but it's got that kind of, it was... A wonderful place to be it had all the fancy shops um, you could buy gold there and wonderful things and it was really rich it also had like things like theatres so it had two massive uh, theatres and although that it was less than half the size of um, Ephesus um, Ephesus only had one theatre so Laodicea just had everything it was a rich wonderful um, place to be and if you want a precious things like we've heard spoken about earlier uh, you went to Laodicea, it, you know, you could get some pretty good Christmas presents from there uh, if they weren't in lockdown. I'm mixing t t today and, and 2,000 years ago now, so we'll just go back to 2,000 years ago. Now, another thing that Andy mentioned last week and a few others have mentioned is there were lots of earthquakes around that region. And in AD 60, uh, I think Andy mentioned this again last week, there was a massive earthquake and the Roman Empire helped to rebuild a lot of the communities around that area. However, Laodicea, interestingly enough, uh, didn't accept the help. Roman Empire said, we'll help to rebuild. And they said, you know what? We're fine. Uh, we don't actually need the money. We'll, we'll resource it ourselves. And they kind of rebuilt Laodicea themselves with their wealth. So, I mean, the basic thing to remember at Laodicea is they didn't need anything. They had everything. They had wealth. They had trade. They had banking. Uh, they had this wonderful uh, hospital uh, where people went from all over the region to train there. 
And it wasn't a bad place to be a Christian either. It was uh, a lot of the, there was a Christian community there. Um, but what we know about the church there at this time was that they weren't that distinctive in many ways from the other people who lived there. Uh, they enjoyed quite a good um, start lifestyle and those kind of things. I was going to liken it to uh, places in Sheffield that I think of when I think of places that don't need anything that are wealthy, but I'm not going to do that um, at the risk of uh, being divisive. <laughs> so that's Laodicea, really, really wonderful place to be. There was one thing that let it down and it was its water supply. And its water supply was not good. If you go to Herapolis, which is just north, uh, you get these warm uh, thermal pools and it's still known today for its warm thermal pools. You can go and lounge there and you know, it's got healing or properties certainly if, if you're, you're achy and you've got um, uh, things like uh, arthritis, just lounging around in a nice thermal pool in Harapolis, just north of Laodicea was a great thing to do. And then just south of Laodicea, uh, as I say, is Colossa. And um, that was just at the, um, the foot of a um, really beautiful mountain called Mount Cadmus and the melted uh, kind of water would come down and would come down the streams and they had kind of almost alpine style cool water to drink. So the two local places uh, near Laodicea were known for their water for different reasons uh, but they were known for the water for good reasons. Uh, Laodicea was very very different. Laodicea basically had it all apart from the water. They had to pipe in the water from their local area and by the time it got to Laodicea it was pretty rank. It was kind of lukewarm, it wasn't cold, it wasn't hot and uh, it also had quite a lot of minerals in it and because it had cooled down the minerals made it taste pretty rank. In fact if you go to Laodicea today you can see these pipes, they've been excavated and they've got them on the hillside and you can see the minerals all deposited on the inside of these pipes and a lot of it wasn't pleasant to drink and it did make you feel kind of quite unwell if you drank it. So really important to know all of that because when Jesus talks to the Laodiceans he makes all these allusions to them and it just makes me think just a little bit of a side note when Jesus speaks to us today and when we're praying, we often talk about having words and pictures and often Jesus uses pictures and words that are familiar to us. He talks about things that uh, are, um, are in our world, if you like. Um, it does make me wonder if in church we should kind of, you know, in Sheffield, why, why, why have I never heard a sermon about stainless steel in Sheffield? Why have I never heard a sermon in, in Sheffield about, you know, um, things that we're well known for. And um, it's just a, just a little aside there. Jesus uses things that we know well uh, because he knows us well. So uh, we, we had this reading um, uh, earlier on in the service and we come to the um, words of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. He says, I know your works to the Christians in Laodicea. You are neither hot nor cold would that you were either cold or hot. And you know, as he's saying this, the people listening to it are thinking, mm, it's getting at the water supply. <laughs> it's the one thing they didn't want to be known for, the water. It's the one thing that they were, wasn't great. And Jesus says to them, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And actually other translation says, I will, I, I will vomit you out. Or you make me want to puke is maybe a kind of modern way of saying it. What is he saying here and why the harshness? Shouldn't Jesus be a bit nicer? You know, I, I kind of wonder when I read these things, I thought Jesus was nice. I thought Jesus loved us. You know, I, I went to uh, university in London. I grew up in Rotherham, but I went to university in London. And um, when I went to London for the first couple of years, I kind of lost my South Yorkshire warmth to some extent. Uh, I really like London and I don't subscribe to the myth that everyone from London is kind of cutthroat and nasty. Uh, but there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of um, skin that you kind of get when you're in London to just kind of be able to get through the crowds and be able to manage the, the uh, hubbub and the busyness. And I came back to South Yorkshire one Christmas and I went shopping with my sister just to the local supermarket. And we were standing in the queue waiting to go to the till. Uh, I'd been in London for about a year and a half by this point. 
And this lady, uh, she was kind of quite a young lady. She had a, a pram with two babies in it. And she went into the queue in front of us. I was already queuing up. And I said to her, um, the queue's behind us, actually. We're, we're already in the queue. Can you, you know, move to the back? And she kind of did begrudgingly. I think one of the children was crying. She looked a bit stressed and a bit harangued. But I was in the queue. So she needed to get behind me. And so uh, I, I said that. She kind of went back. And my sister turned to me and said, when did you become such a... I won't say what she said. Um, but she, she basically said, when did you become such a self-centered idiot? And uh, I think she walked off, actually. She left me to buy this stuff. And uh, she caught up with me later on in the day. And I remember at the time thinking, it's a bit harsh. Um, don't think I deserve that. But looking back, I totally deserved it. I was being kind of crass. I was being unkind. I was being, um, I, was, I just wasn't being loving at all. And I wonder whether the Laodiceans here kind of deserved this. I wonder whether this harsh word to them was exactly what they needed to hear. You see, the Christians in Laodicea were starting to feel the same way to Jesus as they felt to the Roman Empire when they'd had that earthquake. You know, the earthquake had happened, their city had been in ruins, and the empire said, let us help you. And they said, no, it's fine, we can do it. And I wonder whether they were starting to feel like that towards Jesus. I wonder if they'd forgotten their need of Jesus. They'd forgotten their desperate, desperate need for Jesus. They'd forgotten that the most precious thing they had wasn't the textiles, it wasn't the gold, it wasn't the banking, it wasn't the medical school, it was Jesus. Um, it says in the passage that he goes on, um, for you say I am rich, I prospered, I need nothing. They thought of themselves as having arrived, life was good. But Jesus goes on to say, you're wretched, you're pitiable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. And you know, the blind thing is not just a random word. He says to a city that's got an eye hospital, you're blind. He says to a city that trades in textiles, you're naked. Basically, it's a bit like my sister saying, sorry, when did you become such a, when did you start to become like this? Back in Deuteronomy 6, if you think back to when the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt, uh, Jesus rescued them in a mighty act of power and they were released into the desert and they were there for about 40, 40 years, wandering around in the desert. And there was a lot of discipleship that happened during that time to that nation and it was some ups and downs. Uh, but just before they go into the promised land, uh, God says this to them. He says, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Basically, he's saying that, you know, you're about to go into comfort. You're about to go into some good years. You're about to start settling down. You're about to start having what you need. Do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And it might not be material comfort that makes us forget our need of God. Sometimes it can be our intellect. You know, you can almost hear Jesus saying, you say that I'm intelligent, I'm well read. Maybe Jesus would say to me, you say to me that you, you've read your Bible commentaries, you know things, you know, you've always been a Christian, but I say that you are still a child. You still are, you know, your, your, your wisdom is, is not even as um, nowhere close to me. Or maybe it's um, even your politics, I think, can be like this. You know, you say, I'm ethically sound, I'm uh, maybe in Sheffield, I'm, I'm liberal, I know about human rights, I campaign for the right things. But Jesus says, your heart still needs work. You still need me. There's a whole host of things that can make us forget our need for Jesus. And I wonder where you're at with this. Do you sense a need for Jesus? Do you sense the fact that you desperately, desperately need him? I know my spiritual health really depends on my remembering my need for him. 
When I used to be at university, and certainly in my teen years, I often reflect on the fact that my faith was more dependent on my need of Jesus. Now, I'm not advocating um, going out and living a life of having a wild parties and stuff, but when, when I was at university, I had quite a few nights when I'd go out and with my friends and things like that, and we'd have a few too many beers. And I remember a lot of the time when I got back into my halls at two, three in the morning, I would suddenly become aware of how desperately, spiritually poor I was, how I'd kind of let down myself, that I'd let down Jesus again. And I remember many, many times coming in late and feeling desperate and falling to my knees and listening to the Christian bands of the time, Delirious, DC Talk, and these kind of great bands. And just sobbing and crying and saying, God, I've done this again and I need you and I, without you, I'm nothing. And I, I, I don't miss being there. I'm glad I've grown up a bit since then. But I do miss the desperate need I felt for him at times. And during lockdown, I think some people have, some people have had the same experience. You know, times have been hard, suffering's been really big. And I think some of us, even if life has been difficult, have experienced our need for Jesus more during this last few months. And that doesn't mean that suffering and hardship is good. It's not necessarily something that Jesus sends, but it is something that he uses to remind us how dependent we are on him. And it's something that he uses to remind us that he is our treasure, that he is the one that this is all about. Now we come to his prescription essentially what do they need to do he says i counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire <laughs> he says this to a city that trades in rich things that have got amazing shops come to me he says if you want to trade if you want to do business come to me you can buy gold from me but not the kind of gold you sell in your shops but gold refined through fire gold inside character so you may be rich. White garments, he says to a city that trades in textiles, so you might clothe yourself. And he says, come to me and buy salve. Come to me, I'm the best eye doctor. Forget your amazing medical school for a second. I'm the one who helps you to see properly. I almost think, you know, I, I'm, so I'm a bit of a theology um, a geek and I love reading commentaries and I almost hear Jesus say to me in this come to me if you want a commentary come to me if you need to know what my word's saying you know Tom Wright and Tim Keller and all these other theologians I love reading I sometimes think that I forget that my need is is actually Jesus he's the one his spirit is the one that brings the scriptures alive. And you may be different. It might be, for some Christians, it might be worship music, that when you really, really need that kind of kick in your spiritual life, you chuck on uh, Bethel or Hillsong or Tim Hughes or Graham Kendrick or whoever it might be. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that becomes your crutch, if that becomes your spiritual go-to place other than Jesus, his word to you at this point is, you know, you say that you've got all the albums, you know all the great songs, you can lead maybe worship or you can sing or harmonize or you can pray in the spirit but if you want to really do business come to me and the famous passage that comes at the end of this behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in to him and eat with him this is so often used of non-Christians I've done alpha course after alpha course after alpha course where they say if you're not a Christian today listen to this verse you know behold i stand at the door and knock and um it's fine to use it in that context but it isn't the context here that is said to christians jesus is saying i stand at the door and knock and this isn't kind gentle tapping he remember he's just said that the laodicean faith almost makes the one in puke this is hammering on the door passionate let me in i want you back i want you back you're mine when we had Thomas baptised and our other um, kids, Joseph and Hannah, 
I felt so passionately at those baptisms that Jesus was saying, this child is mine. And I, I pray and hope that for me and for Bethan and for my kids, if we ever forget our need for Jesus, that he will hammer on the door of our hearts and shout out and shout out, I want you back, I want you back, I want you back. And if sometimes that requires hard words, then so be it. Because if the church forgets our desperate need for Jesus, uh, we will become lukewarm. And you know, he'll just let us go and he'll start working elsewhere until we get the message. I um, went to a conference for the persecuted church a few years back and there was someone who spoke from a church that was experiencing terrible persecution and they said at the end what should we pray for you and he said do not pray that the persecution stops because if the persecution stops we will forget our need of him pray instead that we will be faithful and the church would continue to grow I found that incredible <laughs> and um, I don't, I know other people that suffer a lot more than me and, and suffering is, I'm not going to get into the theology of suffering here, but there is something about this that makes us realise that we need him. Last two things, um, Will and Jill recommended to me a while ago, The Chosen, and if you, uh, which is a kind of um, crowdfunded media representation, dramatization of Jesus' life. It's amazing. If you get a chance to watch it, watch it, download it, it's an app chosen. And when I watch it, every time I watch it and see Jesus being acted out by these amazing actors, I, I find it so hard not to weep because I suddenly remember I need him and I need to realize my need for him every single day. Now, the final thing I'm going to say is the Laodicean message got through. The Laodicean message got through. The city became a bishopric. It became the seat of a Christian bishop later on. We know that uh, there was a Christian council there in the 4th century. We know that they um, discussed many things there. Archaeologists have discovered about 20 ancient Christian chapels and churches there. We knew that the church grew. We knew that the church became big. We knew that the church of Laodicea later on took up an entire city block and dates to the beginning of the 4th century. We know that this message got through. Jesus' words got through. And they even had a church council there in the 4th century when they discussed, interestingly enough, the Bible. And you know what? The Laodicean church argued that the book of Revelation not be included in the Bible at that point because it was such a shameful message for them to hear. But thank God Jesus spoke so plainly to them because it got through and the gospel spread from there. So I'm going to pray now, um, just as we come uh, to respond. So I just invite you at home to put your hands out to receive and listen carefully. Can you hear Jesus knocking on the door. Can you hear him knock? Have you forgotten that your deepest need is him? And if you have the amazing promise in this verse is that he's not miles away. He's literally just outside the door. He's waiting there. He's hammering on the door. He's saying, I want you back. You are mine. You are called by name. You are mine. Let me in. Jesus, I pray that in the areas of our life where we are desperate, we would hear you say that you can provide us with gold refined by fire. You can clothe us. You can heal our blindness. For those of us that need that hard word, Lord, let us hear it. And for those of us who need that word of comfort, that you are just outside the door, thank you that you are not far away. Help us to open up the door. Help us to let you in. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.